So we're back again for our, oh, listen, everybody is asking, why is it we're wearing the same shirts? Uh, there, we did not intend this. I had no idea that he was going to wear a black t-shirt. Uh, he had no idea that I was going to do like this. It just shows that we like each other and we think alike. And <laughs> three minds do think alike. In this case, we're color, color coordinated in our, in our apparel, apparel. Now, we are moving to another response. We've said we do this. We would look at the comments. Mel has been looking at the comments from the, uh, the, the two previous videos that we put up earlier on Iconoclasm. And one of the comebacks is that, hold on a minute, you're you're only confronting the problem with iconoclasm in Islam. What about the problem of iconoclasm in Christianity, in the West? And that's a perfectly good, legitimate question to ask. So Mel is going to take it on. Uh, he's not running away from it. We do need to refer to it. We do need to unpack it. And what you're going to find out is Mel wants to find out who influenced who. Are, is Was iconoclasm, was it rampant at that time? And was it considered to be anathema? He's going to try to answer that question and then show you the influences between the two different camps, the two different, in this case, the Arabs who then move into what then becomes Islam and those who are from the Christian Judaic world who retained and remained. And uh, it's going to be fun what he's going to come up with and to show you. So over to you, Mel. Good to have you okay. back again. Uh, I love your shirt. It's a uh, very uh, <laughs> got good taste. I, uh, you also are also a walking advertisement for, uh, is it? <laughs> Something like that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so maybe the t-shirts aren't original, but hopefully the, the, the videos of the last uh, few videos have been a little bit more original. But um, yeah, let's let's go, go straight this in. This is titled Iconoclasms in the West. This is uh, in response to many questions as regards, you know, what exactly happened in the West and how does it relate to what happened in Islam? And it's sort of a chicken and, and the egg story, which came first. Um, this is not going to be particularly conclusive. Um, we're going to be sort of suggesting perhaps that maybe it's not quite the way we've always thought it happened. Um, but let's see what happened. So this is a very um, high-end view on, on the events on the ground. I'm not um, suggesting that my presentation covers every little aspect, but it'll give you the gist of, of the main uh, movers and players at that time. So our good old friend, Abdul al Malik, he attempts to set out his stall on the world stage particularly in 694 AD here with his coin. Um, and uh, you can see he's, he's holding his sword and uh, he's asserting his sovereignty in the face of the Byzantines way off in the West. And uh, it's interesting that the following year, there was a bit of a response, let's say. The decision of Justinian II's government to add a full face image of Christ on the obverse of imperial coins in 695 was bound to cause a reaction. In effect, it was asserting the sovereignty and kingship of Christ over all and was thumbing its nose at the Arabs' rejection of Christ's kingship. Look at, at the size of Christ here on the coin and compared to little Abdul al-Malik <laughs> and the other coin from the year before. So I think this is brilliant um, real politics going on here. Um, it's, I, I think it's genius. Uh, it's kind of like a, a Twitter war between the Byzantines and the Arabs at the time. And, uh, the, you know, the, the Byzantines were, were um, really giving it back to the Arabs and they were saying, no, we're not even going to put an image of ourselves here on the coin. We're going to put who the king of kings really is and right smack on the coin as, as large as they could make it. So I, I think it's brilliant. And, uh, and so... If uh, Justinian was trying to troll Abdul al-Malik, he certainly didn't need to wait long for a reaction. This move by him was likely one of the main reasons why Abdul, um, Caliph Abdul al-Malik did, did an about turn and stopped his earlier adoption of Byzantine coin types. He started a purely Islamic coinage with lettering only. Rather than attempting to create an even bigger image of himself, he took a different tack. He decided to replace the image of the ruler with Quranic verses that attacked the Trinity. And this is from 695, 696, so probably just straight after um, the Byzantine one. And on the coin, it says, there is no God but God. He has no associate. Muhammad is the prophet of God. 
And as you can see there, what is he attacking? He's basically attacking that Byzantine coin, I would suggest, where Christ is uh, the king. Let me just say something he, here about that, because the fact that he has no associates is not the Shahada today. That, that is only for that period, which is confronting specifically that very thing. Associate, the people who were the Christians were called associators. They were called that at that time. So he is no associate. He cannot be alongside God. So it taxes divinity. That has been taken out subsequently, and only there's only one God but God, and Muhammad is just, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, without the uh, sharkatu, has been taken out of there. But it is there on the coins, in that, for exactly what you're saying, it is a confrontation against the idea of Jesus as God. Absolutely. And this ties in lovely with what Odin mentioned about his definition of the associators that's found in the Quran, which is uh, Christians. Yeah. And so this, we see how it all just uh, links up perfectly. Um, and so, okay, that happened, you know, in the seventh century. When did the first iconoclasm happen? Well, it happened from 726 to 787. Uh, AD. Define, the define iconoclasm for people who may not know what that word means. Okay, so essentially it's a ban on religious images. You know, um, that's there's a little bit more to than that, but you know, that's enough for us to to understand what we're talking about. It was Emperor Leo the Third who introduced a ban on religious images, and this was continued by his successors. There was a widespread persecution of Christians who supported the veneration of images, and many images were destroyed. Did this was done despite the firm opposition of the Pope to this policy and also the Patriarch of Constantinople, Germanus I, uh, was, who was either deposed or resigned following the ban. He wrote that it amounted to an admission of past error and therefore weakened the Christian position in the eyes of Muslims. So essentially, the Christian leaders at the time thought that this move by Leo III was a ridiculous idea. Um, it didn't strengthen Christians in the eyes of uh, Muslims. It actually weakened them, weakened their position. Um, but Leo III did this, and uh, despite the fact that the main religious leaders of the day disagreed with him. So it's an odd uh, move on his part, considering um, he, he's doing it presumably for religious reasons. Um, so... In Leo, Leo's 730 edict, he forbade the religious images, which he termed a craft of idolatry. And what's interesting, Leo allowed images of himself on coins, but he banned religious images even of Christ. So that's quite strange in, in one respect. However, the ban... Uh, uh, sorry, I may have repeated myself here. However, the ban, interestingly enough, did not apply to the image of the emperor or to religious symbols such as the cross. Um, so fine if you have an image of himself, but not fine if you have images of Christ. Now, as much as he wanted this to be a kind of a strongly religious thing to, to ban the images, you can imagine the reaction of many Christians at the time they would have probably thought, well, uh, this is this is wrong, what he's doing. He, he's putting himself above Christ, essentially, by saying that his image is okay, but the image of Christ is not acceptable. Um, whereas his side would have said, no, no, this is really just forbidding religious images, uh, whereas other images are perfectly fine. So there is kind of an ambiguity there in terms of the, the justification uh, for this. Now, Leo's reason to ban images doesn't appear to be a sycophantic copying of Muslims. Two reasons often cited for his decision were the military reversals against the Muslims and, interestingly, a submarine volcanic eruption near the island of Santorini, which led to devasta devastating tsunamis and huge loss of life. He concluded that this was an act of God in punishment for their use of images. In contrast to Leo III, the caliphs indulged in wall-to-wall -wall images in their palaces right through the 630s and 640s, as we saw in an earlier video. Leo's number one goal was to prevent a further conquest westwards, and in that he was successful. So I would suggest that 
his main purpose really is he 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 saw the use of images in, in a really religious context at least um, as something that God didn't approve of, and uh, that he blamed this for why he was having military reversals. And when a tsunami happened as a result of a volcanic a volcanic eruption, this furthered and strengthened his case, and so therefore he implemented this ban on religious images. I don't know if you want to jump in on any of that, Jay. No, no, I mean this I I no, this it's fascinating because th- this would suggest therefore this had nothing to do with the iconoclasm of Islam at that time. As we have said, the icon as you said in your previous episodes, the iconoclasm of Islam actually is doesn't even exist in the seventh century. It looks like these are natural reasons. And you can see all the way through history when you have a uh, in this case, defeats, or when you have natural disasters, you st- you st- the only way that you can understand them is because you're doing something wrong. So what are you doing wrong? Well, he just chooses iconic. I- the icons is the problem because that could be idolatry. Quick way to do that is to please the pl- populace. Yeah. Um, and uh, I suppose, you know, it's the one thing that you want if you fail with anything is you want a scapegoat, you know, like um, I think it wasn't it Nero who who um, blamed the Christians um, back in uh, I'm going to say uh, uh, 66 AD, um, century AD. Yeah. Um, so you know he blamed the Christians at that time um, and uh, for for the fire in Rome. Now it's 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 rumored it was rumored at the time that actually he wanted to rebuild Rome and build broad streets and so on and uh, fire occurred. Um, and it was a good um, opportunity to rebuild the city. But he, you know, at that time he had a, a useful scapegoat, which was the, the tiny minority, which were Christians. So here we have Leo III doing something quite similar. He doesn't obviously want to blame himself for the failure that that he's a poor military leader. He he obviously, with a name like Leo, you know, Leo the Lion, he's a lot at stake. Um, he doesn't want to be known as uh, you know Leo the Lamb. <laughs> He wants to blame it on on, on someone else um, or something else. In fact, um, on the, he wants to blame it on the icons. Um, so it's a useful um, way to pass the blame on on elsewhere. Now um, there is some logic to what he did. The pro- prohibition of making images clarified, as we'll see in Exodus twenty five. But if we look at Exodus twenty, uh, verse four to six we can see how he might have used this uh, to justify his point of view. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. So if you are only aware of this uh, set of verses from Exodus 20, you would say, well, yes, Leo was perfectly justified. These these, um, icons and so on, these religious images are totally disapproved of by the Bible. And so, so therefore, you know, he's right to have done that. But if you concluded it from these verses, you'd, you'd be wrong, because if we turn to Exodus 25, there are um, permissions given where icons are allowed and actually encouraged. And so if you look at Exodus 25, 19 onwards, we have God commanding the creation of uh, religious images. As long as they're not for false gods, um, it's, it's for, for the, um, the beautification of um, the ark. Um, it's perfectly fine. So here we have it here. Make one cherub on one end and the second cherub on the other. Make the cherubim of one piece with the cover at the two ends. And then further down, it says, above the cover between the two cherubim cherubim that are over the Ark of the Covenant Law, I, being God, will meet with you and give you all my commands for the Israelites. So here we can see that Jews and then later Christians uh, were given permission to use images in a religious context, as long as we, as you know, the context is right. We're talking to, 
about them in the context of the real living God and not uh, in relation to false gods. Um, and so Leo obviously just ignored this bit. Uh, he referred to the earlier passage that we saw. Now, it's interesting that St. John of Damascus, um, and this, I just point out that incidentally, Leo was born in Damascus as well. But St. John of Damascus was not in favor of what Leo was doing. He says, I venture to draw an image of the invisible God, not as invisible, but as having become visible for our sakes through flesh and blood. Adding that images are expressions for remembrance, either of wonder or an honor or dishonor or good or evil. And that a book is also a written image in another form. He defended the religious use of images based on the Christian doctrine of Jesus as an incarnation. Now, um, my memory of the Bible may not be so, so good, but I'm sure there is a passage in the Bible that says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He has, if you like, come into the world uh, in, in human form. And so, therefore, he, he's essentially God's image for himself. And Christians have, have viewed that from day one as essentially be, them being given permission from God uh, to think of God with an image. Therefore, Jesus is, is, is God's image for us. Um, I don't know if you want to jump in on any of that, Jay. No, and I would suggest that there, it's obvious that you can see that this can be taken both ways because you do have the desecration. Uh, you do have images that, that God was angered by. I mean, you, can, you needn't look no further than the, than the golden calf uh, when, Mo, when Moses went up to Mount Sinai, or if you want to look in the example of Jesus in the temple where he was overturning the tables because there, were there, there they were desecrating the temple by selling images and also selling animals. And so th there are cases where God does go against it, but that's a desecration. That is, th those are in place of God. They are replacements for God, and that's what God is confronting. And in this case, I, I agree with John of Damascus completely. We do that all the time. And that's why we have images today. We want to remember. The best way to remember is to have paintings or pictures or movies or any sort of, of helps to remind us of what Christ did. And that's why, well, movies are probably the best example. You can go and see all the entire, I mean, my favorite, mo one of my favorite movies as a little kid was the Ten Commandments, Charlton Heston as Moses. And he's still is my Moses today. So whenever I read the Bible, I think of Charlton Heston with that, that strong, beard and the, the red and white and black robe that he always wore everywhere. So I, I think there, I mean, John Damascus is correct. We don't, by putting the images up, we don't revere them or, or uh, worship them. In this yeah. case, uh, I think Leo had what's going too, too strong against, but I think what you said earlier is the reason he needed, he needed a scapegoat. That's probably why he confronted it at this level. Yeah. I suppose, and just to use a familiar um, idea, you know, many of our audience would probably have pictures of our family, maybe we might even have pictures of our family on our desk at, at work and so on. But that image of our family is not that person. Uh, and we know that it's just there to remind us of that person, but it isn't uh, that person. So we don't look at the image and go, that, that's you, or that's, you know, talking to say their, 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 their mother, or their father, the brother, or their sister, or whoever it might be. And the same for Christian imagery. We don't think that this image is God, it is just a reminder of God. As long as in our minds we keep that in, in mind, there's no problem. But if we start treating that image, even if it was an image of Jesus, if we start treating that image as if that was God, that's where the problem lies. And it's it's kind of a distinction that, you know, even Christians need to, to keep in mind, you know. Well, you did, um, going back, just go back, just one last thing. You remember in our, our previous episode where you talked about Muhammad's image and that up until the 1500s, that image was perfectly legitimate. And then in the 1500s, they start covering his face as if to give him reverence, or in this case, it was seen as idolatrous. So that's unfortunate that that happened. I find it fascinating that this is the same time when, they, uh, when, when you start to see this uh, anathema against tombs that we had in the previous episode as well. And so you can see that this, uh, this effort by Muslims, at least, to confront iconoclasts. And now you're still talking about Christians here. This is in whatever that is, whenever that is done, I think it's, it's overdone. And, in the, and I would suggest that this is because of the fact of 
because of what had just happened earlier with the eruption and also with the fact that they lost the battles. Yeah. Okay, so we now have uh, the Council of Hieria in 754, and Leo III's successor, Constantine V, summoned the council that focused on the question of religious imagery. There were 330 to 340 bishops which, per which participated. It declared the unlawful art of painting living creatures blasphemed the fundamental doctrine of our salvation, namely the incarnation of Christ, and contradicted the six holy synods. If anyone shall endeavour to represent the forms of the saints in lifeless pictures with material colours, which are of no value, for this notion is vain and introduced by the devil, and does not rather represent their virtues as living images in himself, etc., let him be anathema, which means let him be cursed. This council claimed to be the legitimate seventh ecumenical council, but its legitimacy is disregarded by both Orthodox and Catholic traditions, as no patriarchs or representatives of the five patriarchs were present. Constantinople was vacant while Antioch, Jerusalem and Alexandria were controlled by Muslims and Rome did not send a representative. So therefore it really didn't count. And so then later we have the second council of Nicaea, 786, 787. When Constantine V's son, Leo IV, uh, from 775 to 780, died. His wife, Irene, took power as regent for her son, Constantine VI, 780 to 97. She called an ecumenical council a year after Leo's death, which restored image veneration. Its decree clarified the matter on October the 13th that venerable and holy images are to be dedicated in the holy churches of God namely the image of our Lord and God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, and of our Immaculate Lady, the Holy Theotokos, and of the angels and all the saints. They are to be accorded the veneration of honour, not indeed the true worship paid to the divine nature alone. You know, emphasis on this. So they had a very clear um, distinction between the two. Never uh, should any image uh, be worshipped. Uh, but in the same way as this is accorded to the life-giving cross, the Holy Gospels, and other sacred offerings. So in a, in a sense, icons were to be treated in the same way as you would a cross or the Gospels. Um, you don't worship them, you just um, treat them with honour. Um, so that was the decision made, and everyone was happy with that, and things moved forward, and the that first iconoclasm ended. Okay. So in essence, the, the message going out was worship God, not the image. Um, Christians may honor Jesus, the saints and angels, etc., to the use of these images, but the image, images may not be worshipped. Only God's divine nature may be worshipped. The distinction is worship Jesus himself, not the image of Jesus. Okay, so that was fine until we have the second iconoclasm, in 814 to 842 AD. Uh, we have another Leo involved in this one, Leo V this time, who observed all the emperors who took up images and venerated them met their death either in revolt or in war. But those who did not venerate images all died a natural death, remained in power until they died and were then laid to rest with all honours in the imperial mausoleum in the Church of the Holy Apostles. Okay. So essentially, what Leo V is doing is this is a logical fallacy. He's he's making a, a false claim about cause and effect. He's assuming because uh, some people didn't venerate images and they had a natural death that therefore that's the reason why those who did uh, take up images and venerated them that they died in war. Uh, um, so, but that was enough reason for him to start the second iconoclasm. Uh, he revived the iconoclasm in an effort to achieve military success. In 815, the revival of iconoclasm was rendered official by a synod held in the Hagia Sophia. But women saved the day in restoring the tradition of venerating images of Christ and the saints. Leo was succeeded by Michael II, then by Theophilus. When he died, his widow, Theodora, became regent for their son, Michael III, 
She presided over the restoration of icon veneration in 843, just as Irene did in 786 to 787. Why was it in both cases it was women that brought back the veneration of images? I would suggest perhaps they understood the importance of beauty in conveying the mysteries of faith, and so they felt perhaps that it was their duty to do something about that um, and uh, restore the kind of the centrality of beauty. And, and I, I think they, they should be honoured for that. Um, we wouldn't have the beautiful churches that we have today were it not for them stepping in and uh, calling a halt to this um, iconoclasm. Um, I don't know if you want to jump in on that at all. No, God bless the women. I'm glad they're yeah. around. I'm glad they have more common sense than many, many of us men. Yeah. So um, now we move on to the third iconoclasm uh, during the Reformation. And what's interesting is the timing of this seems to coincide with um, the, uh, let's say, the, the move towards removing the image of Muhammad in the paintings from that time. And again, it's a chicken and egg situation, which came first. It's not particularly clear. Um, it could be that Muslims started doing this first and then Christians imitated them, or might, it might have been the other way around. It's hard to say, but it's interesting, the timing. The first uh, iconoclastic wave of this era, let's say, happened in Wittenberg in the early 1520s under reformers Thomas Munster and Andreas Karlstad in the absence of Martin Luther. Luther argued that the mental picturing of Christ when reading the scriptures was similar in character to art, artistic renderings of Christ. So Luther was not against the idea of um, depicting Christ in an image. In contrast to the Lutherans who favored certain types of sacred art in their churches and homes, the reformed or Calvinist leaders, in particular Karlstad, uh, Zwingli and Calvin, encouraged the removal of religious images by invoking the Decalogue's prohibition of idolatry and the manufacture of graven or sculpted images of God. As a result, individuals attacked statues and images, most famously in the Beel Inden storm across the Netherlands in 1566. However, in most cases, civil authorities removed images in an orderly manner in the newly reformed Protestant cities and territories of Europe. In the 16th century, Islam also began to move against the religious images of Muhammad by veiling his face. It is difficult to determine who influenced who during this period, but considering that the Calvinists were more radical than Muslims were in destroying and removing religious images, it seems plausible that the influence was from west to east and not vice versa. And if we look at the, the map there, we can see how close the Ottomans were. So the Ottomans essentially were uh, east of this red line, and the reformers were west of, of that line, way off here. Um, so we can imagine that there was the possibility of influence going both ways across both sides. Um, with, the Ottomans, with the Ottoman Empire's border reaching just short of Vienna, it is likely that theological ideas permeated both sides of the religious divide. Like many Muslims today, um, he argued, this, this being Calvin, argued that images of God lead to idolatry. And he also said that the human heart is a perpetual idol factory. Um, and this is my last slide. So I'd hand it back to you, Jay, if you, if you want to comment on this. No, I think this is fascinating. So this is um, what you're saying is possibly it looks like the whole iconoclasm that we have talked about in our previous episodes coming much, much, much later than what the traditions are telling us. Traditions say that this happened at the time of Muhammad. Traditions are written in 9th to 10th century. We're now realizing that many of those traditions are probably written even, even later in the 16th century. And it looks like that's when this iconoclasm probably came into uh, be, uh, to be uh, into influence among the Islamic empire possibly you're saying because it was influenced by the west <clears throat> by the christians in the west 
who had just in the 1500s before that, the 16th century, had started their third wave of echinoclasm. Possibly. This is, I mean, what you've done here, and it's been good because you're not, you're not really saying that this is exactly what ha- one influenced the other. You're putting the question out there, who influenced who? It seems that there in Christianity, there have been groups that have risen and then fallen and risen and fallen. And in the, you gave three examples of three different periods. Uh, the first one in the, in the 700s, uh, the second one you put to the uh, 800s, and then the third one in the 1500s. And in every case, well, certainly the, la- the, the last, well, the last two uh, were, well, no, let's say the first and the second one, not the third one, but the first and second one were then eradicated by women. And why not? Let's let the women, let's let the women uh, do so because they, in some ways, can see areas that a lot of us don't see. And I'm not trying to be sexist here that I'm against males, but certainly what we do know is that it's fascinating how the Lord has used women all the way through his ministry. He did so at the very beginning, and he's also doing so here. But it's a kind of class. I mean, I'm not an iconoclast kind of myself. I think it's great that they have images. I think it's terrific that people have images, and I think it's good that people wear crosses and they have so have pictures of of the nativity scene. We do that on Christmas time. Uh, we are the first to put images of Christ there in the in the cradle, and we have all kinds of music. We do that all the time. Our music is not idolatrous at all. In fact, I I wouldn't know what I'd do without music. I feel sorry for the Muslims that, that don't, and it's fascinating because the Muslims don't have music and they don't have imagery. And so therefore their God who is already vacant and never enters time and space, they have never seen him face to face. They will never see him face to face because they have eradicated him from the 16th century on. And it's the 16th century that, that interests me. That's quite late. And that the fact that this is not from the seventh century, not from the eighth century, not even from the ninth and 10th century, where it is then we see it red and we see it coming to four. It looks like it is from the 16th century when this, when these, writings were finally the manuscripts that we have today, much, much later rendition. Is it because of Christianity? Was it because of the third iconoclast? I don't know. Good question you put out there. Let's see what people yeah. find out. I'd like to see what the response. I'm sure some will may agree with you, Mel. Others will probably dispute with you. Yeah. Either way, you're bringing yeah. up an interesting, an interesting question that you yeah. haven't answered, but you have at least given us a historical survey of where these the iconoclast movements did happen, uh, and that there were three of them primarily. 7th century, uh, 700, 800s, and then 1500s that in every case have been shut down because I think of laws for logical reasons. We are permitted to have pictures of Jesus. I want pictures of Jesus. I want pictures of everything he did and said. I want the pictures also of the prophets. We can't because we've never seen them, but we have representations of them as long as we don't worship those pictures. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose... um I'm, I, I was asked by many viewers to ref, to to give a reaction to the iconoclasms, and really, when I looked at the evidence, I didn't find anything particularly strong one way or the other. It didn't seem like um, the Byzantines were copying the Muslims. I think that's one answer we've got. That it, does, it looks like they had their own particular reasons for banning the images. It didn't depend on the Arabs. Um, and then if we turn to the 16th century, um, it's a 50-50 who influenced who. They were probably drawn from a common culture between the two. The ideas were in the ether, as it were, and probably influencing people. But I think the the, the arguments that um, Christians had for banning uh, images at that time were different arguments from what the Muslims would have had when, when they were banning images of Muhammad. Um, yeah, and and probably- that you brought up also that when it was ever used, it was always used for political reasons. In both the first and second, they were used to not only explain or, get, or to blame the, the, the defeats in war against, by the Muslim, against the Muslims, uh, but also in the later time to actually help them to go to war and to give them some type of uh, uh, an, an, an aid, in this case, a public aid to help them defeat their enemies. So if that is the reason, that is not a theological reason, that is a political reason. And if it's a political reason, then that should be thrown out. And I'm glad that we don't use that anymore today. And I'm glad to see uh, that we as Christians, we can pray to God, we can worship and we can sing and we can draw him and we can even do comics against him. And we don't sit there and eradicate those who mock him because we are even permitted to mock Jesus and committed to mock our prophets. I would say it's actually a good thing that this all happened, particularly in the 
those first two iconoclasms because Christians clarified exactly what they were doing with the images. And, you know, Muslims often accuse us of adultery ourselves because we have images. But here we have Christians saying what we're allowed to do and what we're not allowed to do. We're allowed to honor Jesus as we should. We're allowed to honor the saints and remember them. But what we're not allowed to do is worship these images. And that's really clear. As long as Christians keep that in mind, we have no problems. But yet Muslims are not able to, to process that. They're not able to make those subtle distinctions. And, and they get muddled around this. They accuse us wrongly of idolatry. And yet they themselves are actually doing things which are clearly idolatry, like kissing the black stone in Mecca. Um, you. So, wow. What an occult yeah. contradiction right there. Yeah. Um, I, I, when I was doing my master's thesis, I went, around, I went around and I asked a lot of converts to Islam from Christianity, who were mostly Afro-Americans, um, why they had converted. And I wanted to find out, and I found about 12 areas, 12 major areas why they converted. And right at the top, not the number one, but number two or three, uh, was this problem, this problem of idolatry. Now, number one was the Trinity, of course, because they just didn't understand it. And the first, if you don't understand it, then you want to eradicate it, get rid of it, think that this is illogical. You want to go with that which is reasonable or, or logical, as they said. But what was fascinating, I always put back to them, I said, okay, this problem with, this problem with uh, idolatry, what idolatry are you talking about? And they said, well, it's the singing. And I said, hold on a minute. And almost all of these were Afro-Americans. I said, you have some of the best music in the world. You, your people... Are the worship? In fact, almost all of your great singers who then go on become popular singers, they all started their singing in churches. Are you suggesting that that is anathema? Of all people, this is your heritage. This is what you have given to the rest of us, and we honor you, and we are so uh, uh, overjoyed because you created jazz. Where do you think jazz came from? You created soul. Where do you think soul came from? It came out of the churches. It came out this this need yeah. to worship God in song. And for them to turn their back on that, in almost every case when I brought this up, they did not have a response to that. And I could see that this, has, this was something they had not thought through. And I would wonder if I had come back, and maybe I should go back and ask them now years later, what do you miss most about what you left behind leaving Christianity become Islam? I would wonder how many of them would miss the fact that they were worship God in both song and in uh, in, in imagery, the imagery that is beautiful that we see. One of the things yeah. that I love about our churches, just the stained glass yeah. windows. And I remember going to London. I was, I went to this church in Wilsden that was now a mosque. And I went inside and the, the imam wanted to show me. He says, look what we've done. We've taken off this anathema, these beautiful stained glass windows and replaced them with plexiglass. Plexiglass. Oh. Yeah. Oh my God. And I just sat there and I almost cried when I said, when I said, when yeah. I saw what they had done, that beauty they had just destroyed. And he was proud of this. And we took out the pews. He said, now we have rugs, all these beautifully ornate pews, just rugs there. And I yeah. turned to him and I says, you have despoiled a, a perfectly beautiful piece of art. All this beautiful, I mean, this is one thing that made this church so beautiful was the art, and you have just destroyed it. And this is what iconoclasm does. It destroys that which should not be destroyed, because these are expressions of beauty. These are ex creative expressions of honor and also of worship. They are worship. Every time you make it, create something that beautiful, that's an act of worship. Yeah. To say to I, throw that out and say that this is anathema, I'm so glad that we in Christianity yeah. come back to our senses. And, you know. Go ahead. You know, I, I just feel like I, this is like a, an important point too. There's a huge contrast in the in the theological view that Christians have in comparison to Muslims, which is we Christians believe that we are created in the image and likeness of God. They believe that we are just slaves of Allah. It's a totally different idea, and it creates a totally different uh, response. If we if, if we if we are living icons, if we are um, images of God. And, and the more we become a good person, the more we are honoring God in, in the way we live. That is a huge encouragement and it creates meaning for life. I don't see any meaning in just merely being a slave for a tyrant. It's a totally different thing. And I think this is, this is really central to um, why a person... Further, if we are nothing more than slaves of God, then you don't want to sit there and have images of him as a master to a slave. But if you see him as your Abba, your father, your daddy, Abba means daddy, and that's the name we give him in Greek. 
in the New Testament. Sure. And you know that historically from the very beginning, we were walking and talking. We were in the presence of God. We could see him face to face all the way through these theophanies that we have all the way through scripture of God coming down and being able to, yes, wrestle with Jacob and be able to talk and eat with uh, Moses. I'm sorry, um, with, with Abraham there in front of the tent of Mamre. These are images of our God who we can see face to face and spent 30 years 33 years on earth and people like John and Matthew wrote about that God, the God who was there in human form. They wrote about what they saw. They wrote about what they heard and they were joyful for having met God face to face. If that is the case, God does present to us. He's not a master. We're, he, he's not a master to us slaves. He is a father and we are his children. If we are his children, then we want to talk about him. We want to depict him. We want to sing to him. We want to rejoice about him. We want to revel in him. And that is expressed all the way through art. It's expressed all the way through song. And it's the beauty of Christianity, more so than probably any other religion, that our God, we have a relationship with. What better way to relate to somebody than to actually draw him and paint him and sing about him and praise him through our art, whatever form that is. Yeah, absolutely. Here, here. Okay. Well, listen, this has been good. You've given us, and I think you've answered the question very well. You haven't really st stipulated who copied who. What is interesting is in almost every case where iconoclasm became a problem in Christianity, what I like you, you've done is you've shown that in some ways that's the aberration. The iconoclasm is the aberration and justifiably got eradicated twice by women. God bless them. Yeah. And thank you for that. And that today we don't have that problem anymore. And that's why in some ways, iconic, uh, the whole icons and the whole beauty of the, what the icons give and this story and the remembrance that helps us to remember things just like pictures do. Uh, we, we have photo albums. Why do we keep photo albums? Because to remember all these things that we have done in our family, well, the same thing we do with Jesus and the same thing we do with our icons uh, in, in our church and our stained glass windows that must remain for there to remind us. Thanks so much, Mel. This has been helpful. There you, Jerry. Me here, 3,000 miles apart. This is Jay and Mel, over and out. Mm -hmm.